Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Now, before anyone comments, wow, there is no way this setup could get any more expensive. Well, might I remind you that this memory card is $200. You also might want to get a reader for it. This setup I'm holding is probably the dream kit for bird and wildlife photographers. It's the $1300 600mm f4 G Master mounted on the $6500 Sony Alpha 1. Actually, we also brought along the 400 f2.8 G Master just in case we wanted something shorter. It's just another prime lens after all. So if we include both lenses, you're looking at about $31,500 worth of gear. 31.7 if you include the card. Now, by no means at all is this a setup that I shoot with on a regular basis. In fact, I'm feeling quite broke already. But the question I hope to get answered here today is, for an ultimate setup that costs this much, what do the images out of it look like? And how much easier do these pieces of gear make to get those images? For starters, there's a new autofocus feature on the A1 that, for now at least, you won't find on any other Sony body. It's got bird eye autofocus. That is not something you'll find even on the A9 Mark II. So now there's bird mode on top of human and animal eye tracking. Does that mean Sony doesn't consider birds as animals? No, not really. The animal mode was really designed for pets. The bird mode means the algorithm will be looking specifically for subjects that resemble birds, including this trash can shaped like a bird. But speaking for biological non-trash can birds, it doesn't actually zap the eyes right away 100% of the time. I would say it's successful at eye tracking for about 60 to 70% of the time for me. But even when it doesn't necessarily highlight the eyes, the autofocus still tracks the bird extremely well. It just kind of falls back to targeting the whole bird instead of pinpointing the eyes. It's even trickier if the bird is in flight, but the system was designed to work with both stationary and in-flight birds. I personally haven't been able to get many shots of birds in flight because, quite frankly, I suck at this. Hopefully, I'm doing a little better now that I've watched nature photographer Consta Punker's class on Skillshare. His class called Wildlife Photography, Capturing Portraits of Your Favorite Animals, has really taught me how patience plus an element of luck is a huge part of wildlife photography. But he also specifically mentions how important it is to know your subject, details like what time of day they're active and which areas they might be living in. You'll also find many other interesting classes like this on Skillshare. They span across a whole range of topics like photography, graphic design, music, and more. Our sponsor Skillshare is an online community home to thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people just like ourselves. It's a platform that encourages exploring new skills, deepening existing passions, and for us to just get lost in creativity. It's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, and being curated specifically for learning means there are no ads on the platform so you can stay focused. They're constantly launching new premium classes, and the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. The autofocus capability that this setup grants, which is simply excellence by the way, I think we're dealing with something that is beyond mere convenience. It's more than that because what it's doing is basically enabling a superhuman response time. I'm fairly certain that no human being can manually pull focus this fast or plant an AF point position that fast, which is why I do think that this is something that stands between getting the shot or completely missing it. There's a peacock chilling over there. And I've got an idea because these two lenses, almost nobody's gonna own both these lenses at the same time. So my question is, since we have this unique situation presented to us, 400 F2.8 G Master versus 600 F4 G Master, how different does the bokeh look? Place your bets. Which one's gonna give you more bokeh? One has a longer focal length, one has a bigger aperture. You guys ready? Here's the 400 F2.8 and here's 600 f4. Now shot from the same distance, the 600 wins for bokeh quantity for sure, although I personally actually prefer the look of the 400 2.8 for this shot. If you look through the EVF on the A1, you'll likely go, ooh, that's a very nice looking EVF. And there's a reason for that. I didn't really count them personally, but there should be just under 9.5 million dots in there. It's also the only EVF that has a refresh rate of 240 Hz, so you can finally watch Gemini Man on it the way Ang Lee intended. And despite the Alpha 1 being Sony's ultimate flagship, there's really not much looks-wise to imply the sheer amount of horsepower contained in that body. In fact, it's not nearly at all an easy camera to identify at a distance. Hey, which A7 are you shooting with? What? It's an A1. I don't believe you. Come closer, look at that. Uh, no, 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 no. 
It is not a pretentious looking camera. If you're trying to show off your new $6,500 camera, it simply doesn't look that flashy. My interpretation is the fellows over at Sony took a very no nonsense approach on this camera and designed it for you to get work done on it instead of displaying it. The largest dose of exclusive luxury you get is probably the gold numbered model badge. The A1 does share the same drive and AF mode selector dials that were previously found only on the A9 cameras, which is something I really appreciate because direct physical access to controls is always a good thing in my opinion. They've also beefed up the mechanical shutter on this with a new drive system, and if you haven't experienced it yet, I hope you get a chance to soon because it sounds and feels lovely. <laughs> It also finally gets the setting to drop the shutter after you power down the camera so it's protecting the sensor. It's also then you get to see something else you paid really good money for, a carbon fiber shutter only on the Alpha One. That lovely mechanical shutter can go up to 10 frames per second in continuous shooting mode, which is actually very average for Sony mirrorless, although the actuation itself does feel snappier. But head on over into electronic shutter territory and you've got options up to 30 frames per second. Let it sink in that that's a faster frame rate than this video you are watching right now. This is 24 frames per second. That is fast enough to shoot video with. In fact, that's exactly what I did. Check out this little experiment I did where I recorded myself by holding down the shutter button in 30 frames per second continuous photo shooting mode. There's no resolution tax when doing 30 FPS bursts, it's the full 50.1 megapixel experience, although there is a bit of a catch. There are a few conditions you need to hit to get the full 30 frames per second. The only RAW option compatible with 30 FPS is compressed RAW, so if you shoot in uncompressed or lossless compressed RAW, you're capped at 20 FPS. And if you're in any of the focus modes outside of AFC, you will need a shutter speed of 1 over 125 or higher to get 30 FPS. If you are in AFC, then your shutter speed needs to be at least 250 of a second. But if you've got those sorted out, you should be happily filling your cards in no time. And then there's the electronic shutter concerns, specifically how movement might be distorted due to rolling shutter. Well, every single photo I'm showing in this video was taken in electronic shutter mode, including pictures of moving animals. Now, it's still possible to see distortion artifacts if you push things to the extreme, like wildly jiggling the camera about. But speaking practically, it has yet to present itself as a limiting factor to me. Even photographing a spinning fan resulted in distortion-free photos. Considering how high resolution the sensor is, the impressively fast readout is very impressive in itself. What does that even mean? The camera in particular is a little unbelievable because we never got the best of both worlds quite like this before. If you want a high resolution, you had to get something like an A7R4, 61 megapixels, but that would max out at 10 frames per second. If you wanted speed, you can use the A9 Mark II, which is 24.2 megapixels, nowhere near 61, still quite respectable, but that would give you 20 frames per second. This can do 30 frames per second at 50.1 megapixels. It always, always sounds too good to be true, but here it is right here in the flesh. It's an A7. It's an A1. A7. It's an A1. One. O-N-E. One. Seven. You see? Seven. Who doesn't like more megapixels? But for bird photographers especially, they would truly appreciate the amount of cropping room 50.1 megapixels offer. Well, bird photographers and anyone who enjoys bragging about megapixels. But if that's your thing, then good news because the A1 does have pixel shift mode, which gives you photos upwards of 200 megapixels. That's almost half the number of pixels I peeped into in this video. The A1's also got the most impressive flashing speeds you'll find in any camera. In mechanical shutter mode, it's an unbelievable 400th of a second, but in electronic shutter mode, it's still 1 over 200. To paint you a picture of how excellent that is, the A7C has a mechanical flashing speed of 1 over 1 60th of a second without resorting to high speed sync, and it cannot sync in electronic shutter mode. Now with all that praise about the A1, there's got to be some sort of compromise. For such a high resolution, it must be terrible in low light. Except it's not. Comparing it against something with a more common pixel count like the A7C, high ISO performance is actually very similar. The A1 is still a camera you can push quite comfortably into the high ISOs, despite being a high resolution shooter. 
Among stills cameras, I think it's not a hyperbole to say that the Sony A1 is the best camera in the world right now. This thing is a bit of a devastation among Pro Series cameras, including Sony's own flagships like the A9 Mark II. But what I find truly savage about this camera is how it single-handedly destroys over in the video department as well. This thing does 8K. I have a dedicated review that covers how this performs as a video camera. So if you're interested, make sure you go ahead and check that out.